So I will go uh, a little bit more deeper into the Pentacom IXL wave, and especially what you just mentioned. Uh, the more we can measure, the more we uh, have questions, so to say, and we need to know what is normal and what is not normal. And, uh, uh, and this is actually a, a huge endeavor, especially if we have to check that we really need a, a big numbers, big data, in order to look into that. And uh, I would like to talk a little bit about that and also go into detail on some, some little case reports uh, which can represent something that you have in, in daily, uh, daily use. So these are my disclosures and of course Oculus is the most important here. We already have heard that in, in what we do every day when we use the Pentacom IXL wave, we can use it for screening, uh, uh, for comorbidities, uh, early ectasia or uh, keratoconus, or we can follow up on the keratoconus or on the therapy, uh, planning cataract, planning fake uh, IOLs, IOL calculation with also new formulas. Uh, everything is possible now, and uh, we actually can really also get rid of some of the machinery we are used to, to have. Sometimes you had to go to a parkour of, of machineries to just do a normal cataract surgery, and now you can actually click on one thing and you get everything. And the question is how, how reliable is it, but uh, we have realized over the years that uh, uh, a Pentacom IXL wave uh, is absolutely equivalent to any other subspecialized machinery. And we now also have tools a little bit in patient education to visualize uh, uh, some kind of, of pathology and, and show the patient, is it the cornea, is it the lens, is it something else that, that is causing some, some trouble. And so there are a lot of things now in there. With the Pentacom IXL wave, the latest uh, new version contains also the objective uh, refraction, as I said, the patient uh, education uh, tool, and uh, uh, it's always updated in terms of IOL calculation and, and formulas for any kind of corneal shape. So a full sequence overview uh, looks more or less like this. Uh, so obviously you can switch between two eyes, yeah, which is also good. <laughs> then you have the uh, objective refraction, also depending on uh, pupil size. So you can also see if there's some shifting during night. Yeah, uh, um, You have uh, uh, a summary for keratometry, corneal properties uh, of the patients, and there are a couple of things there. Uh, cord mu is the same as angle kappa. It's called cord because it's measuring a distance in millimeter and not an angle. Yeah? Otherwise, it would, call, it would be called angle alpha. Cord alpha, uh, um, angle kappa, sorry. Uh, cord alpha is angle alpha uh, in a similar fashion. Um, different parameters of the anterior chamber. Um, then also things like a back front ratio, which gives you an idea if uh, somebody did a LASIK or something on the patient, and with and and some some alarm bells ring when certain features doesn't fit together, and the Pentacam is is doing that already. Um, here is the visual performance depending on the pupil diameter. You have the total cornea, the internal aberrations, and the total eye aberrations. Sometimes you can see that uh, either whatever. Uh, you have uh, presbyopia, you have cataract or something, or you have a PCO, uh, and then you see the difference uh, uh, if you look at the internal and, and the, the corneal uh, performance. These kind of stuff you can see. You have a retro illumination photo that gives you an idea uh, that there is maybe a cataract, or you can actually document the cataract even in a case who's still able to see 0 0.8 or something. And you still, because of his, uh, the problem he is, is having, you're doing a surgery, a cataract surgery. Yeah? So you can kind of make sure that the insurance company is not uh, suing you uh, because you can document there is a cataract. But there are a lot of patients where you see you must have very low visual acuity. In reality, they still can see 1.0. Or they correct with glasses for a corneal nuclear sclerosis, still have a fat cataract, but can see decently. So you can document that very nicely. Um, and for example, here's a post myopic laser profile. Uh, of course, the machine already realizes that this is a long eye, uh, but has a normal refraction. So uh, it gives you some idea because the patient not always tells you that. Yeah? Or the patient says, oh, I had laser treatment. And then the, the, the uh, um, technician writes that down. It could be laser treatment of the cornea. It could be also a macular uh, um, retinal hole or something like this. For the patient, everything you do in the eye is laser surgery, regardless what you do. It's always laser surgery. Yeah? So sometimes this information from the patient doesn't bring you a lot. But if you look at the, at the machinery, you can, you can see this. And also look here, flat and thin cornea, and approximately then the 
the so-called back uh, front ratio is fairly low, which gives you already, if you just look at this, you already see there something has been done uh, with the cornea. Yeah, let's go further. So what we are doing now is a, is a normative data study where we have really, through, throughout the world, we try to cover almost all uh, kind of, of, of groups, ethnies, and, and, and continents. Uh, and all of these users have the Pentacom IXL waves, the newest one. Uh, and we're gathering all these data and, and building, so to say, the virtual human eye with all the data that, that we can have, and then also uh, improve the indices within the machine, as well as see what is normal, what is uh, outside it. I will give you just a small example here, a subset uh, of data that we, we have from, from my clinic and from Italy and Spain. Uh, 1,082 patients were evaluated. Here are the parameters that we have looked at. And uh, one thing is, for example, if you want to measure the ocular apparometry, it would be better to do this with an untouched pupil, not dilate this to whatever, and then recalculate things. Uh, uh, this is very important. And this is not measured with the Scheinfluke system. Yeah, it's uh, measured with a, a Hartmann check uh, device, the apparometry. Only the, uh, the corneal apparometry is independently from also being able to be measured from the Scheinfluke tomography. Yeah, so in this, it is important that the pupil is working. And interestingly, if we look at it, even in those uh, over 70 years, they have a mesopic pupil of more than four millimeters, which is more than enough to measure apparometry in a, in a, in a good way. And you are not forced to kind of interpolate and calculate these things. So you get really the measurement. So 70% of the elderly population have that, uh, and this assures good good values. If we look at these values, for example, here we, can, we look at them and we uh, uh, are correlating, for example, here pupil diameter with age. We can see under photopic condition not, but under mesopic we have a strong correlation with age. Yeah, The older, the smaller gets the pupil under mesopic condition. Uh, uh, if you are in your, in your 90s, uh, you rarely have a pupil larger than three millimeters. Uh, we saw actually a gender difference yeah, between uh, a man and, and uh, a woman. Women have a larger pupil on average compared to, to men. Uh, we could see that uh, in, this, in this study, it's significantly different. Um, then we look at the apparometry. As I said, we measure corneal aberrations and cornea front back, internal aberrations and total eye aberrations, uh, uh, and can visualize this with the um, E um, uh, logo. Interestingly, here the, uh, the uh, uh, high order aberration, they have a moderate uh, correlation to the cornea and a strong uh, correlation to the total eye. Uh, 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 Values uh, in relation to age, yeah, we could see that. For example, here also the spherical operation. Uh, the funny thing is, the mean value from 20 to 70 or 80 is 0.27. So what, for example, is used in the Technus lens for calculation. However, there is no patient with 0.27. Yeah, if they are in the 30s, they have 0.17. If they are in the 70s, they have 0.37. Yeah, there may be one guy in 58 years old who has that. Yeah, so so if we look at this, uh, 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 this is just an average value. And in all studies, you always have this average value. Yeah, but but uh, there is no individual patient really having that. You always are a little bit above or below. And if you go into more detail, go into smaller, like three or four millimeter, it is much less uh, what you have as spherical aberration. So we always kind of overcorrecting or overcompensating it. So operation neutral lenses are actually not such a bad idea. Yeah. Um, let's go to some clinical cases, some little things, nothing really so spectacular. Uh, uh, here's a patient who was supposed to get a toric monofocal plus lens and an eye hands toric. So we look at, uh, at the card, we look at the values. The patient's pre-op uh, refraction was plus uh, three and a quarter diopter and minus three diopter astigmatism. Um, you see here two diopters of astigmatism in the, in the uh, UL master. And uh, let's have a look here in the pentacom and in the calculation. If we use the data from the uh, pentacom and if we use the J and J calculator, he offers us a torus of 3.75 diopters. Uh, 
And if we use the calculation with the uh, um, Pentacam, they offered us a lens with three diopters of torus. So that's a relevant difference. Yeah? It's kind of difficult now how to decide. So you can say, okay, we trust the company. Yeah, it's their lens, it's their calculator. So let's let's put the lens in. So that's what we did. The calculated post-op refraction would be like this, and with the uh, pentacam and the barrectoric would be like this. We selected this one, and we ended up like this. Yeah. But you have to really look. It's not really a wrong calculation. Yeah, because we also have a flip of axis. Yeah. So we have to go into detail here. So one thing we can do is to, to check, for example, the uh, um, retroillumination photo, look at the centration, look at the, uh, you can see here the, the marks. Yeah? So we can very exactly look at the, the position of the lens, then we know the final refraction or the uh, residual refraction, and we can see uh, uh, what, uh, what the problem is. And then if we take the values, we can go, we can do two things, well, okay. So this is the axis we actually have. We have a decentration here uh, uh, of several millimeters uh, uh, and degrees. Then we take these actual values and the uh, uh, values we want to get it to and take, for example, a web page like uh, Astigmatismus Fix from uh, Björdal and Harden. And they will tell us, okay, under these conditions, with this and this lens and this and this refraction and so on, you have to turn this 14 degrees uh, uh, in this direction, and then you will end up somewhere around ametropia. Yeah, but the pentacom can do this exactly the same. Yeah, so you have already the data; you can put them all in. You just have to add the lens you put in, and then the pentacom is looking at it, look at all the data that you have, look at the implanted lenses. Then you can decide if you are interested in exchanging this lens, or do piggyback, or do or rotate the toric IOL. And uh, it also differentiates between just uh, decentration or rotation, or for example, a post-LASIK or PRK patient, which is a different story compared to changing this. And with that, you can also calculate that. And here we got the same outcome, similar to the uh, recommendation, uh, how to turn the lens in order to get to the right point. And uh, uh, the recommendations rotate the lens, uh, something like 13, 14 degrees so that we end up around uh, 19, 20 degrees. Uh, uh, and then they predicted this post-op astigmatism, and at the end, we did that. We ended up there, here at 19 degrees. We can follow it. We were at uh, 0.8 with minus 0.5 spherical, so I would say that fits quite well. Uh -huh. So this is uh, like you walk through a complicated case and, and you can get the information. Or here, toric trifocal lens. Uh, uh, this was a 62-year-old patient uh, with early cataract. Otherwise, was was okay. This was a uh, visual acuity of the patient. Now we look here uh, uh, at the pentacam uh, XL wave and uh, at the internal uh, uh, things, and we also look at several other factors here, as we usually do here, the K values and everything. Astigmatism here, 0.8 diopters. Uh, again, uh, here I wanted to put in the crystal lens, artisambiosal lens, calculation uh, of the torus from the Pentacom IXL wave, because we have 0.8, almost one diopter uh, measured, that would translate into like a 1.5 diopter toric correction. That makes sense, it's a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, with uh, uh, the UL master, uh, we measured fairly low astigmatism, and uh, the recommendation was no uh, toric lens or uh, just a small one with uh, 0.75. Yeah, this was this one here. This was the uh, uh, lens based on on this calculation. Yeah, so learning from the first case, we used this uh, calculation from the Pentacam, and we ended up plano at zero, and patient was 2020. Yeah, so this is how this evolves in your practice. Yeah, you have one case, the other case, then you think, let's move to this uh, calculation, and and then you get the confirmation, and and you get this. This is also interesting case. I got this from Dr. Savini. Where he really very elaborately worked on this case. 55 years, lawyer uh, looking for presbyopic lens exchange, 
and this uh, is a myopic patient minus three minus four. So this is a very very bad combination of everything. Yeah, first of all, he is already good in the near. Yeah, with minus three. So to top that is not easy. Then uh, 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 he has good visual acuity correct in 2020. And I wouldn't really be so annoyed about the lawyer thing. Yeah, all people think about the lawyer, but they usually they are pretty nice people. Yeah, they are not so bad. Yeah, <laughs> there there's another profession that has much more impact. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you look at this, and then you look. So is he suitable for it? Yeah. Uh, for we look here at the, at the left eye. Look here, keratometry doesn't look so so special here. If you look at this, uh, this is okay. Then we look at uh, the the uh, axial and sagittal uh, curvature, total cornea refractive power. Yeah, we see a little steepening down there. Uh, uh, we see does it have an impact? Well, let's look at the mesopic pupil at night. It's 4.8, so it's outside that region, so it's okay too. We can can look at this. Let's see. Here we have not much difference in terms of refraction during day and night, so there's no, no changes there. This is also good uh, uh, in, this, in this patient. Refraction is stable there. What else can we look at? So high order aberration, cornea, everything doesn't look too bad. A little bit of coma, but otherwise it's fine. If we take, for example, also the, uh, the, the values that we already have from the, from the data uh, group, what is normal, what is not normal. Here we are a little bit in the uh, in the area where we can suspect already treatment, but he did not have a treatment. Yeah, we could really ask that with uh, several things like here yeah, ACD. Uh, he is in the normal uh, age range. Uh, other things like anterior chamber angle. He's a little bit smaller. The anterior segment is slightly smaller, but it's still all in an area. If we look at the uh, at the normal values that we measured with, with the big study, we can see that he is always within normal limits or standard deviations. Here, high order aberrations is also in the middle of uh, the average. As I said, coma was slightly outliner, but not really so much, not, not dangerously. Uh, uh, trefoil is also in the normal area, pre-op. Uh, spherical aberration is also in the normal range. So if we look at this patient, we can say similar refracta uh, refraction day and night, fits also to the axial length, normal pupil diameter at night and shallow anterior chamber. It's not so bad, actually. It could be minimize the risk for negative dysphotopsia because they are closer together. Yeah? So it's even uh, good information. With the rule astigmatism, and uh, uh, it was measured you know, easily, not, not, not so difficult. The uh, uh, Anterior and the total uh, corneal refractive power maps look the same. We saw this little uh, inferior steepening, but it was outside the, the pupil area. High, little high order uh, opera, uh, aberrations, but not really in a, in a uh, values over 0.5 or something, where you sometimes uh, think about not putting in diffractive technology. Spherical corneal aberrations were, were okay. Uh, you can compensate if you want with a spherical IOL. High corneal coma and trefoil, but low. Uh, back front ratio, some other values, in, in general, uh, uh, should, be, should be okay to use these patients. So there are not big alarm clocks here. Yeah? Uh, but it's a high challenge because a uh, patient has a, has a good visual acuity and myopic and stuff. So uh, Dr. Savini uh, selected the panoptics, did the surgery, everything went perfect. And then first day, it was 2050, 0.4. No improvement by any spectacles. He didn't accept anything. So, ouch. Yeah. Did everything. Looked at everything. Excluded everything. Find the reasons why everything is fine. What is the source? Well, you look at it. Uh, uh, the first thing that you see, if you go, so you see the pre-op high order aberrations and total eye uh, aberrometry, and then look at the post-op. They have been much increased, very much increased. Uh, so how how come this can happen? Lens itself is not tilted or, or something like this. This has been could be could be seen. Yeah, centration is everything is okay. So we had this little thing with the steepening there. Yeah, it was there, and then we can see that it actually moved up into the pupillary area. Yeah, just this little tiny thing. Uh, and this can cause this kind of changes. 
and can have an impact uh, on visual acuity. However, the treatment is waiting, yeah? aggressive waiting, yeah? active waiting. Uh, uh, and then what you see, this little island goes down and down and down and kind of moves out of the uh, pupillary zone and after half a year, uh, uh, this thing has changed. The uh, high order aberrations have changed also. They didn't go away, it was not that they are at zero, but compared uh, to in between, they become uh, uh, smaller as you can see here. Yeah, compared to directly after the surgery. They were not exactly the same as preoperatively, but they became um, very much down, and the patient then had an uncorrected visual acuity of 1.0, and everything was fine. Yeah. So first of all here, you did everything right. Yeah. Still, it can happen, something like this, but you can follow up with a pentacom. You can explain that to the patient why he has this. You can also explain to him, let's just wait. It will maybe go away. Yeah, and everything was like this, and so you were under control. Yeah, so this is quite quite interesting case. Let's also talk a little bit about the keratograph. We already uh, uh, heard uh, quite a bit about it. I, I also like it very much. I have to say, uh, as you have heard, we have different scan modi: uh, the tear film scan, the the meibomium scan, uh, then other forms of imaging. Uh, um, and uh, uh, a couple of things you're measuring, actually, quite a bit. Yeah? You have nine different uh, fields to describe um, the anterior surface and the impact of this. And um, we have a patient here, 63 years old, got a femtofarco with a measure of a trifocal lens. First day or first week post-op, uncorrected visual acuity was 0.8 to 1.0. Everybody was happy. Then after four weeks, he comes for the next follow-up and it was 0.4. Yeah, slit lamp, everything was nice, lens looked good. We did pentacam, there was nothing really uh, remarkable uh, in the pentacam. Then we did the uh, the keratograph, and uh, on the left eye we saw a difference here uh, uh, with uh, um, the amount of, of, of tears, yeah? So you can measure the meniscus here of the, other, of the tears. So there was a little lack of this. Then we look at the interferometry of the tear film, and we could see that he has a lipid uh, deficiency in both eyes, and, and 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 pretty much of it actually. Then we look at the uh, uh, break up time, and I like this really much because you can really get a land uh, 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 plan of the of the anterior cornea uh, uh, where uh, the tear film is breaking up, and you could clearly see that you have a huge difference here. Uh, uh, and, and a, a very short uh, break-up time. So it was clear it is a uh, uh, dry eye, that's all. Three weeks of antibiotic eye drops changes the flora and the surface of the eye, and these patients, very often that they have after three, four weeks, uh, they go down with visual acuity. And um, this is uh, the, the, the graph you get. Then you can show the patient, look at this, you had, you're here in the red area, you're missing a certain amount of... Uh, of the ingredients of your tear film, and we are going to treat this, and then you will be fine. So you're very in a, in a very comfortable position. Uh, you can explain to the patient what has happened. You can educate him, and then later on, you can also show him that it gets better. And uh, uh, we treated him, and everything was fine. Uh, so it's it's very good if you have something in your hand, something also that looks scientific or a sound makes sense, and then you can explain that to the patient and solve this problem. So with the Pentacom XL Wave, we have an excellent machine for preoperative evaluation and, and these cataract refractive patients got all information to also exclude maybe uh, problematic patients, uh, postoperative evaluation of problematic cases and unhappy patients. You have something in your hand, you can show them. Yeah? And this is, I think, nowadays, otherwise they depend on that they just believe in you. Yeah? Uh, um. And with the Keratograph 5M, we have additional tool dealing with the anterior surface and uh, uh, then can also consequently treat things or exclude patients where, where this, this would be an option. So, uh, thank you very much for your attention. So, we still have five minutes for discussion and uh, I think we both are... Happy to answer any any question or comments. Uh, uh. No comments. Did, did you all eat too much and you are sleeping now? Is that the reason? Yes. Okay. 
Pues, uh, impressive uh, presentation as usual, Professor. I, I would like to know, because with Pentagon uh, Wave, we have the possibility of make the selection the, of the, in the preparative the patient, the indication of the lens, the calculate, and also do the follow-up with this case that you show us. Uh, what could be for you in the preoperative the cutoff and the parameter most important to select the patient and to select the lens? Um, well, the first thing is uh, uh, when you look at the, at, the, uh, uh, at the lens selection, toric or non-toric, yeah? So this is easy. I mean, you can also do with other machinery, but this is also a basic thing. Uh, uh, if you look at quality of vision, uh, uh, you you look at the the, uh, the aberrations in general, spherical aberrations, <laughs> high order aberrations. Um, you may also look uh, at the at the tear film and uh, the dry eye is symptomatic. And when you when you do that, there are there are extreme cases sometimes where you get uh, you don't need to exclude somebody, but you you should get suspicious. Yeah, then look into it more. And then you maybe come up and exclude the patient. Uh, um, you may have borderline patient where everything else is perfect, personality, you know, he is relaxed, he would accept some side effects, and you will be fine. And you may also have somebody who is a very strange personality, and then you're lucky you find something objective, you can show him and say, because of this, we cannot do this. Yeah? But now it's very handy. Yeah, yeah, but it's it's important, and you can prove it. Yeah, it's not that you tell him you are crazy. You tell him you have a, a, a aberrated cornea, and you can have a, a, a objectively you can have problems. Yeah, and and there you you can, can can use that. It's not that this machine tells you you take a trifocal or you take an EDOF lens or you take this company or that company. That this machine cannot tell you that. Yeah, that can, the ma maximum they can tell you is be careful with this type of lens. Yeah, uh, uh, but but it's not that it takes away the, the professional decision from you and which direction you would go and what you recommend. It just gives you an, an, a help. Other comments? How many people have a Pentacom RXL wave here? One, two, I mean. So these are all potential customers. Yeah. Not yet, okay. Who, how many people are using like three, four different machines in order to look at their patients? Is that something very common? Yeah, much more common. Yeah, yeah. Two. Two, yeah. Yeah, okay. That's interesting. Okay. The keratograph. Yeah. yeah, we use them actually now more or less routinely, yeah. I have to say, at least in my, my, my private patient. I have to admit there is a difference if I have a 90-year-old grandma which has a mature cataract in the workup and if I have a private patient of 55 who comes for a fatigue lens exchange. Yeah, uh, we, we, the, the, there's a different work. work, work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Then I think uh, we, are, we are done here, and uh, I thank you all for your patience. And <laughs> yeah, thank you.